Wentworth. He's drawn at Amanti, he's drawn in other places, RISD and all sorts of other things. But his journey is interesting because, you know, I guess all of us take diversions in our journey with the, um, with the past um, and the way that our careers unfold. I never thought when I was studying architecture that I'd ever teach. I was going to practice and do and I thought I was always going to do modern buildings, and this was it. Forget about all these old things. Uh, and then I realized as time goes on, the old is not only with us, but very important for us. And so, you know, when it goes from architecture to something else, to writing about architecture, to thinking about it. So the journey's, and he's taken an interesting, so maybe if you tell us a little bit about your background, and sure. then your journey as well, it would be great. So, sure. thank you, I'll hand you over to you. So hi. How many of you have uh, gotten a degree in architecture before, or are they're all in the process? Of, uh, all in the process of getting architecture degrees. Okay, so everyone. Well, there's HP here. So what, what do you mean? So how many people have gotten, or are in the process of getting professional degrees of architecture? Okay, huh. and the rest, and but everyone's doing the HP? They've taken, the, the, uh, the architects take this as an elective. Okay. The HP have to take this okay. as a, a required course. So it's two degree, two degree paths converge in this room. In this room. And there's some other courses which also, mm -hmm. you know, people take the courses, both architects and HP. We're trying to make sure in the new curriculum that mm -hmm. there's more exchange between the two groups, mm -hmm. which I think is important. Well, that. I'm asking because I think it's uh, noteworthy uh, how the story that I'm about to tell unfolded in a very unexpected manner. <clears throat> in that, like Hassan, I went to architecture school because I loved architecture and I expected to be working as an architect in a firm for the rest of my career. Uh, and something odd happened that uh, uh, several odd things happened that brings me to this room today telling this story. Uh, so I graduated from uh, the Cooper Union in New York City uh, and as expected I uh, proceeded to get jobs in several different architecture firms in New York and San Francisco. Uh, was happily going along my merry way, uh, developing my, I passed the licensing exam, I did all my internship. Uh, but then a, uh, an economic recession hit uh, in the 90s. And it suddenly looked like it was gonna be difficult to pursue the career in architecture uninterrupted by layoffs and all sorts of things. And I had been indulging an interest in, um, in uh, urban space. I, when I was doing my analysis in my third year of architecture school, you know how in architecture school they ask you to pick a building and do a deep analysis? Have you done that? So I picked the Salk Institute, and I went deep into the structural, the ingenious structural system of the Virendale trusses and was obsessed with how they built the buildings because I had an engineering background. But then the first weird thing that happened in my brain in my third year of architecture school is I started to realize that the, the magical element of the Salk Institute is that plaza with the water going down the middle. There, the but you all know it, right? That, that, the history there, right? that channel of water and something snapped and I realized it's not about the building. It's about the space between the buildings. And if he had put it closer, it wouldn't be right. If he'd put it farther away, it wouldn't be right. It was just like this Goldilocksing process of getting the space just right. That uh, fired off all kinds of neurons in my brain and it felt so intoxicating that um, I decided to go to Rome. So I learned Italian. I spent a year learning Italian, and I was applying, as soon as I graduated from architecture school, I was applying for grants at the same time as pur pursuing my uh, path 
uh, as an architect, I didn't get any of the grants, uh, and so I was just minding my business, working away back when we used to use pencils to draw drawings. And, um, but then another weird thing happened, um, is my girlfriend at the time, she was a career-long pianist. She was practicing five days a week, she was quite accomplished. Uh, and uh, she came home one day, she was doing a master's degree in piano performance. She came home one day and said, uh, I'm done. And from that moment forward, she never played the piano again. But she was still a musician in her, in her heart, so she studied Japanese shakuhachi, this beautiful bamboo flute. She studied Ghanaian drumming. Uh, and then she started playing this thing called the gamelan, which comes from Indonesia. And so she introduced me to Indonesia. How many people uh, know anything about Indonesia? Like, what is Indonesia? Yeah, yeah. yeah. what is it? Country. It's a country. Yeah, is a it a bunch of islands? Where is it? Southeast, Southeast Asia. It's the largest Muslim population. How, how do you know that? How did you know that? You're, break, you're ruining my... <laughs> I was listening to NPR this morning and you said an election. Yeah, who won? Uh, the this guy that loves heavy metal music and but chose a cleric as his running mate. Was ah. it Prabowo or Joko Wee? Uh, Joko Wee. I want to say it's Joko Wee. Alhamdulillah. It's, 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 it's Joko Wee. Oh my god. <laughs> That's such good news. <laughs> so, but how, the rest of you, Indonesia, is it big or small? Let's start there. Who says it's big? Who says it's small? Well, it must be small if we've never heard of it, right? Uh, that's what I was thinking when uh, my girlfriend came home and said, I'm going to play gamelan. And I said, what's gamelan? And um, she said, it's this thing from Indonesia. And I said, what's Indonesia? Um, and she said, it's this country. Um, it turns out I, I've, I got two Ds uh, in my career as a student. One was in uh, sixth grade. I got a D on my social studies uh, report on Southeast Asia. This, I don't know if I've told this story to you. <laughs> So I got a D in that. And then the second D I got was when I transferred from uh, University of Colorado Boulder and I transferred to the Cooper Union. And I always, always just sat down at this thing called a typewriter and I would just write my papers and I'd get an A. And um, I tried doing that at the Cooper Union and I got a D. And it was in architectural history. So the two Ds I got was in Southeast Asia and architectural history. And I don't know if this had any impact on me, but looking back, I'm now uh, brought into schools like this because of my expertise on the architectural history of Southeast Asia. So who knew what a great gift it was to hold me to a higher standard in sixth grade and then when I transferred. Anyway, it turns out that Indonesia is the fourth most populous country in the world. Um, and it turns out that it's also one of the most densely populated places. And there's a, there's a, um, an association, maybe I can use that. You can, but you have to plug this thing into your... I, maybe I'll advance from here, but I'll use the pointer. No, but you have to use, you have to use this. Oh, know, it so won't point? No. Oh, wow. I didn't know what. So okay. you can advance and... Is this going to mess things up? No, it shouldn't do. So, So I like this map, and I've never been able to find a newer version of it, because this is kind of old data. But it shows population density in this part of the world that we don't know very well here in the United States. But it turns out that um, the dense, most densely populated places in the world uh, are also places that have been densely populated for a very long time. So India, Japan, 
the coastal areas uh, and river uh, basins of China, and the island of Java down here. And they've, they've, they're the most populated places in the world. They've been populated for a very long time, and they are the, um, the birthplaces of some of the oldest civilizations, the oldest cultural, continuously advancing cultures in the world. And so we were just looking at Japan and some of its cultures. I think Issei Shrine is somewhere around there. Um, and now this is the island of Java in the country of Indonesia, which there's Singapore right there. This is the island of Sumatra, Java, Bali, which who's heard of Bali? Yeah, Bali's the famous thing, but it's a tiny little island in the middle of Indonesia. Uh, most of the island of Borneo is part of Indonesia. Sulawesi, the Spice Islands, where uh, Christopher Columbus was trying to get here when he discovered, ran into North America. Um, and then it keeps going beyond here to uh, the western half of uh, the island of New Guinea. Uh, and Australia is down here where these outlets are, so not far away. So that's Indonesia. There are the Philippines. We've heard of Vietnam because we fought some war, did some war time there. Um, India, Bangladesh, uh, Myanmar, all of those places. So that's, uh, but the interesting thing about the world in the 21st century, as we quickly approach peak human around 2060 when we will hit 10 billion people and then level off, um, about half the world's population lives in the area depicted on this map. So it's important. I'm going to unplug this because it's not permitting me to advance manually. Uh, it's a volcanic region uh, which uh, every v eruption uh, increases the soil uh, richness. And so it's, it's able to support a huge population based on rice farming. And uh, this is the largest Buddhist temple in the world called Borobudur. Uh, it's one of the large stone monuments of the island of Java. And when we think of historic preservation, we often think of things like this, where the building is, very, is obviously very important. Uh, the culture that constructed the building is long gone and in the past. Uh, there are still Buddhist communities, but uh, it's a different Buddhist community. The current Buddhist monastery on the site of Borobudur is not the continuation of the Buddhist culture that was there uh, when Borobudur was built in the ninth century. So it's an example that we're more comfortable with and more familiar with uh, in historic <coughs> preservation because the living culture that produced the architecture is gone. And we have the building as evidence of that culture. And so we use the building to figure out what the values of the society were and thus what's important about the architecture to preserve. Now that's very different from what I ran into when I arrived in Java. Um, this is the photo that my girlfriend showed me uh, and she, it came with a story. The, the photo itself doesn't seem that compelling when I look back at it now, but it came with this story of this very dense urban situation, this very dense neighborhood. And at the end of this uh, dirt path through this dense neighborhood, uh, there was this gate building, and through the gates was this lush garden, this inner sanctum inside, uh, and a, a collection of buildings all built uh, around this household uh, of uh, a royal family or a very wealthy family. And the, the royal family was gone uh, when she visited, and uh, it was a place where a lot of musicians got together and they, they would stay there. They rented little rooms off to the side. And that's where I went. Um, so I, uh, when I saw this photo, I said, wow, that looks interesting. 
forget about Rome, forget about Italy, forget about Italian. I switched gears and when the recession hit, I was given a three month grant. I applied and, and received a three month grant to go uh, do research uh, on the architecture, the relationship between architecture and urban space in Java. And, and it was really based on this photo. Without much else to go on, I went to the New York Public Library and I thought I'd just look at all the books on Javanese architecture. And uh, it turned out to be a much shorter visit than I thought because all I got was this one book. There was one book in English on uh, Javanese architecture. And I took it out, read it cover to cover, didn't learn much about anything that was relevant except for these old stone monuments. And so I arrived uh, to this place, here's the capital city, Jakarta, and all the indications uh, that you see in the photo suggest that um, it's just another Asian city where there's some old neighborhoods of low single-story buildings that are slowly, slowly getting replaced during the modern era, post-war era, by concrete buildings and commercial, and then a highway uh, surrounded by, um, by skyscrapers. And it is what it is. It is exactly what it seems to be, globalization, modernization of an Asian city. But then at the center, uh, and off, off the screen, I can see it, but you can't, so let me go to the next one. There's, at the center of the city, there's this uh, monument at the center, and again, it's easy to interpret this. It's the National Mall, it's the monument, it's the Washington Monument, but uh, redone in Jakarta, the capital city of Indonesia after independence. But there's, um, and so all of the evidence suggests, allows this standard conventional reading um, to any visitor, and there's the mosque in the background, the largest Muslim uh, country in the world, 92% Muslim, uh, thus the hot potato of where's Islam in your electoral campaign? How do you get elected based on your relationship to Islam? Then the Protestant church in the background, um, To you know, there's this friendly, so far mostly friendly competition between different religions. So it is what it is, uh, and it seems fairly straightforward. Um, so when I arrived, that's what I encountered. Uh, but then a weird thing happened. I, um, I arrived, I went through that gate, and it was late in the day, and I said, can I stay here tonight? And they said, sure. So I rented a room. I woke up the next morning, and I came out, and my Indonesian was pretty good because I studied all summer long in this intensive course. Um, and no one spoke English, so I was struggling to understand the situation. And I said, so what can you tell me about this house and this garden? And they said, well, you know, it's uh, a former, the f house of, uh, was built by a prince long ago, and there used to be a prince here, uh, and it's a miniature replica of the palace. And I said, palace? And he said, yeah, there's a palace. And he said, what, there's a palace? And he said, yeah, just go out the gate, turn right, and you'll find it. And so I went out the gate, turned right, asked around, and I found this. And this was presented to me as the palace. And so I started asking questions. There was a guard at this gate there, inside this pavilion. I think that's him there, sitting. And uh, I said, so what is, what's the story of the palace? And he said, oh yeah, it's the palace. Uh, and he started talking about it as this old historic place. Uh, and he said, there's a museum and you can go and see the museum. And then someone entered into a, a car pulled up. Some people got out and the guard uh, put his hands together and bowed to the people passing through the main door. And I said, who's that? And he said, oh, that was the prince. And I said, the prince, there's a prince? So up until this moment, I thought, you know, okay, dead culture, I got it, I know how this works. You know, the, here's the architectural remains of some former civilization. But all of a sudden, there's a prince. And he said, yeah, there's 36 princes and princesses. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, there's a king. And I said, king? 
And he said, yeah. And I said, how did he have 36 children? And he said, well, he has six wives. Uh, and I'm freaking out at this point. And um, one thing leads to another. I get to know the people in the palace. And this is the image that shows uh, some of the nobility of the palace in the setting of the palace. This is, I chose this image because it's uh, one of the most dramatic images of wooden structures falling apart. Uh, this is a sacred structure that had been moved from the former palace site in a parade uh, in 1745 from the old palace site to the new palace site and erected here because it's one of the oldest structures uh, of the kingdom and it was preserved in this state. They put the diagonals in just to keep it up and they put this mat on at one point to keep the rain off. Uh, really as a demonstration of the fact that these people are de dedicated to the religious practices and so much that the religion of Java depends so completely on the continuation of the religious ceremonies that they use any money they can get their hands on. They use it to continue the religious practices. The buildings themselves are allowed to decay because they just don't have the money. It's a lower priority than the religious practices. So compare that to Borobudur, where we preserve the building. In this case, uh, their priority was on the religious practices, not the buildings themselves. So it turns out there's a king. Here's the king. I met the king. I met uh, his son, all of his sons. Um, it turns out that. Um, the, uh, I became very close friends with one of the princes who was uh, in charge of running the day-to-day -day life of the palace. And he and I started talking. And I said, uh, listen, uh, your buildings need some help. I don't know if you noticed. And he said, yeah, the buildings need help. And he said, we have no money. And I said, well, um, maybe I should help you out. So my three-month grant um, I stretched it because it's so inexpensive to live there. I stretched my three-month grant to a year and a half. And by asking questions and saying what's going on and how can I help and what do you need and what's important, I was able to stay for four years uh, working as uh, the royal architect of the palace for all intents and purposes. Uh, and this was my training. I did not have the benefit of this course. I did not have the benefit of Roger Williams' education. I was just an architect uh, who was interested in the Salk Institute. Um, but by asking questions, it, uh, it led me down this path to understand how there, just like when I arrived in Jakarta, you can see Jakarta as this place that's just another modern city, or you can see it as a place where these long-standing traditions uh, are having an impact on uh, the world today. And uh, I started seeing that when I started seeing some of the uh, ritual practices. This is so much like Issei Shrine that um, I'm really glad we had Issei Shrine first. Inside, behind the shroud here, there is a, a canon, a sacred canon, that used to be a priest, and he went into a cave uh, and turned into this canon uh, after uh, several days of meditation. And this priest and the king himself are the only ones who are allowed to s set eyes on the canon. And so even when it gets cleaned uh, in this ritual once a year, uh, you, you can't, it, you're not allowed to see it. And so they, they clean the cannon, they clean the glass pavilion that protects the cannon, and they clean the structure that protects the glass pavilion. And so there's the glass pavilion inside this sacred old structure uh, and the people cleaning it. And the water, the, the dirty water that gets washed off the floors are frantically collected in this fierce competition for all the, by all these women 
to get fill their little plastic bottles of some of this dirty water because the water is sacred. It came off the cannon, it came off the buildings of the sacred palace structure. And so it seems to have some importance in the minds of these people. Uh, they will pour a little bit of the water in their rice fields. They will pour a little bit of the water in the porridge of what they're feeding their children to keep them healthy. Um, doesn't sound right to me, all that dirty water, but, um, and so uh, there's this odd mixing of cultural belief systems uh, that have an impact on the life and the architecture. And the architecture plays a central role in this. Uh, and the key word here is syncretism. Uh, how many people have heard the word uh, syncretism? Syncretic. What does it mean? Uh, it's essentially when you mix a bunch of different pieces together to create a uh, one-fourth Yeah. Is that, did she get it right? Anything to add? I want to give everyone a chance. Yeah, that's it. So um, instead, when a new thing comes into our culture, instead of embracing it and rejecting everything that came before, or rejecting it because it's different from what we do, we say, hey, that looks cool, and it gets brought in, and uh, it has an impact and an influence on the existing culture. And the Javanese have a word for this. Uh, it's called the Javanization of cultural elements. And so you see in this one picture this, this brass band brought from Europe through the Dutch colonial the 300 years, 350 years of Dutch colonial influence, uh, they said, sure, brass band, we can do that. And so they've javanized the brass band and made it part of their, uh, their celebrations. They've javanized the Ottoman uh, hat, the fez, that's not a very clear picture, it's much clearer here. They javanized uh, the Dutch tails coat that uh, is being worn by each of these people. They snipped off the tails uh, because it uh, conflicted with the short sword that they have to they have to wear a dagger in the the rear sash of their sarong their skirts their Javanese skirt sarong they have to tuck a short sword in the back and the tails were getting flipped up so they snipped those off and it's a really clear demonstration of how syncretism. Uh, the syncretic, uh, st strategic melding of cultural elements allows them to keep adding things without losing a sense of groundedness in Javanese culture. And you even see it in the building, uh, the Baroque, the Dutch Baroque architecture. This is um, a junior palace of the same city of Surakarta uh, that uh, a Dutch architect came in the 20s during the colonial period and help them uh, rebuild the palace or extend the palace in this Dutch way. Um, and uh, the Dutch queen Wilhelmina gave this gift to her counterpart in Java, the king of Java, uh, gave him this, this uh, carriage. And this white dot down here um, is uh, a sacred, it's an offering because over the decades, this has gone from being just this Dutch colonial Baroque carriage to becoming a sacred relic uh, incorporated into the cosmological functioning of the palace and the king itself. Um, and so every Wednesday night, because Thursday is a sacred holy day every week, every Wednesday night they have to put offerings down to keep the gods uh, happy and appeased and keep the balance of the forces. And so I was asking questions and saying, what's going on here, what's going on here? And getting answers that indicated that uh, there's a lot going on here. Um, this slide is in the wrong place, but this is what the palace looked like after a fire uh, raged through the palace <coughs> complex in 1985. And you see, the, the sacred tower dedicated to the Queen of the South Seas survived. The library miraculously survived. But the main most sacred buildings of the palace, 
uh, were, at, were completely consumed. Um, so uh, we'll get to that. Um, I'm trying to get the sequence. Here we go. So more on syncretism, uh, here we have a photo that could have been taken uh, if they had photography, it could have been taken uh, hundreds of years ago because these uh, ritual practices have been going on for that long. Uh, and it's a very interesting thing that this is a Muslim holiday that, um, uh, of Qurabeg Maulud, uh, but it's being celebrated using these Hindu symbols. And so I found this, this Islamic kingdom uh, celebrating a Muslim holiday using Hindu symbols. And so this is the linga and the yoni, uh, which uh, if you go back to the roots of these symbols of linga and yoni, they're celebrating the duality uh, of male and female and how they bring together to generate as the source of all creation. The, and so it's really the male genitalia and the female genitalia abstracted and symbolized in these offerings uh, uh, according to Hindu practices. But the syncretism at work here uh, has given us uh, uh, these symbols from Hindu belief systems as a central element of a Muslim holiday. And so the palace itself, um, this is the part at the center, the most sacred part, and uh, those symbols are created in the kitchen here, and they're brought through the palace along the ceremonial axis. Uh, this is north over to the right, and I've tilted it to get, get the image larger on the screen. But this, this ritual is to, you go from the center of the palace out through along this uh, ritual axis and take a left and go to the royal mosque located here uh, as part of this larger palace complex. And so that's what we're doing here. We're parading. Oh, I'm sorry about that. That's so loud. That's a reminder of what time it is. Does that tell you every hour what time it is? Yeah, it got turned on and I have to figure out how to turn it off. If <laughs> someone knows, uh, please see me after class. Um, so, so there we have the, the male and female symbols marching through along the axis to this, the great mosque of Surakarta itself is a syncretic uh, interpretation of the Hindu Javanese architecture of the Meru roof, this very specific sacred roof form that you see all over Bali because Bali is still a Hindu society. And so you see these roof forms all over Bali in their Hindu uh, temples. Uh, and here, that Hindu roof form and the architectural form has been reinterpreted as, a, as the, the mosque that started in Java and spread throughout Southeast Asia. So throughout Malaysia uh, and elsewhere in Southeast Asia, you see this as the, the classic mosque form until recently when there's a kind of a um, a pan-Islamization where you see onion domes and other symbols uh, from overseas coming through to replace all of these forms. Uh, and so here we are. These offerings sit at the mosque. The essence of those offerings are taken um, by um, Allah. And once those, that essence of the offering has been released from the offerings, then the, what's left, the physical offerings, are brought out to the front of the mosque where they are ripped to shreds. Uh, again, the people apparently believe very fervently that there is sacred power in these, um, these symbols. Um, and so here's a third demonstration of how strong the belief system is. Uh, this is the uh, Javanese New Year, where people walk in from villages uh, in a 50 kilometer radius, they walk in and they arrive at the palace and they line the streets of the core of the city and they wait in silent meditation for the emergence of the sacred objects. So the, the priests of the palace 
look at what happened in the past year and they look at the predictions of what is going to happen in the coming year and in order to fix the things that went wrong and prevent the things that they predict are likely to go wrong in the coming year, they choose certain sacred objects from the collection of the palace and they cover them up because they don't want to set off panic if someone sees um, if someone sees the symbol, uh, the object that reduces the likelihood of a volcanic eruption. Uh, they don't want to send people into a panic to, to show them, what, so they cover them up. And they bring it out front, they're waiting for the, and they parade these objects uh, counterclockwise around the palace to uh, release those energies and uh, the parade is led by these sacred white buffalo who magically know when to show up in the middle of the city when it's time for uh, Javanese New Year. And when the buffalo um, uh, stop, the whole parade stops. And when the buffalo walk, we all walk. And when they trot, when they start to run, everybody picks up their skirts and starts running behind them to try to keep up with the buffalo. And when they relieve themselves on the streets, uh, the people break ranks and they quickly try to grab whatever they can, whether it's liquid or solid. They grab it because it's from the sacred white buffalo. And they put it in their rice fields to, to ensure a good harvest. Uh, and so this, again, the parade goes around the outside of the outer walls of the palace um, all the way around and back in. And sometimes it takes two hours, sometimes it takes five hours, depending on the speed the buffalo go. Um, did, you, did you ever take part? Uh, yeah, I, so I, three or four times, yeah. Did you go in for the group? <laughs> I, I deferred to those. I didn't want to deprive them of any, anything. Yeah, I didn't want to be greedy. So I just allowed them, yeah. I would say, oh, missed it again. <laughs> um, so they run out, like, if, so everybody goes for whatever is on the floor, and if it runs out, then you're out of luck? Yeah. Uh, so I mean, everybody, no, no. so the, the, the streets are lined with uh, five people deep, the entire route, all the way around, because there's tens of thousands of people who show I mean, the city is uh, 800,000 people, so there's already a lot of people there. But then tens of thousands of more people, the population swells for this event, and they line the streets. And um, if, the, if they're lucky enough and the buffalo <laughs> relieves itself in front of them, they, they jump out from the sides of the streets, while all the rest of us, there's like 2,000 of us walking behind. So. I, I, didn't, I wasn't close enough to the buffalo because I wasn't important enough. I was way back in the middle um, with some of the princes and princesses or behind the princes and princesses and their entourage. And so there's a hierarchy um, that's important to keep, and keep track of at all times. I was once in Singapore for a, a historic preservation conference and I said to the prince, I said, you should come. And um, he said, okay. And I got to the airport, and there were uh, 25 people there. And the king was there. And it turns out the king wanted to come too. So this was the beginning of the project I'm about to describe. Uh, they all went to Singapore, and we were in an elevator at one point. And uh, we were, uh, like a dozen of us were in the elevator, and the door opened, and there was an awkward pause when no one moved. Because you have to, maintain the hierarchy as you move in and out through every threshold. And so the most important people, uh, wasn't the king first, someone had to go out before the king and then I think the king was second. And then the, the oldest of the children would go and then the rank order and then I, you know, and in the meantime, the door's going eh, 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 you know, it's just, you know, I was like, oh my God, we're going to break it. And no, everyone calmly and allowed, you know, got, it, got the sequence right because you, you got to respect these things. And so that's another story of the hundreds of stories 
of this hierarchy that has to be maintained at all points, whether it's the parade around the palace or getting in and out of the elevator or where you sit in the restaurant. There is a place for everyone and it has to be respected at all times. Even though this was in the 1990s uh, and you'd think um, that all kinds of things were possible. Uh, I was allowed to believe that when I first started talking with the prince, we would sit, I would come in the front door here and come in through this and we'd sit in this building and this is where we had our conversations. Um, every few days we'd meet and we'd just talk some more. And he allowed me to believe that sure, there's a king and a royal family, but uh, they have no power, they have no importance. It's just an old set of buildings that are falling apart and end of story. But as I started to see all these different rituals being enacted, it started to be clear and clear to me that that wasn't all there is to the story, that actually there's a living tradition, there's a living culture that is still very important to a lot of people. Thus the poop scooping and the walking in from the villages and all the things, there's no other way to explain it. Uh, and that's why the living culture, the religious importance, the religious and cultural importance of this place uh, is so high that they have to keep all of these things going with whatever money they have, regardless of the state of the buildings. Uh, it was not so much in, we call it a palace, but uh, so far I haven't shown you any gold leaf, I haven't shown you the big stone uh, sculptures, there's not a lot, it's a wooden structure, it's a lot like Issei. And wooden structures get built, they rot and fall into the dirt and they get rebuilt, they catch on fire and are destroyed in great spasms of loss and then they are rebuilt. Uh, but the traditions and the meanings and the spiritual, uh, the operation of spiritual forces continues on regardless of whether this is the same piece of wood that was there 300 years ago or not. Uh, the wood comes and goes, but its meaning remains, just like Issei Shrine. Um, so it turns out, as I learned more, that uh, even before Hinduism, there was this animist Javanese culture where the queen of the South Seas, this mythical queen who lived under the ocean, uh, uh, had a romantic relationship with the king uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And she promised that every descendant of this original king would uh, be in her favor and would be under her protection. And so every year, uh, rain, this is a rainstorm, well, I can't see it so well here. Uh, they give offerings at the South Sea, at the Indian Ocean. Uh, and there's this Hindu Javanese cosmological system that came much later. And when, the, when trade between Java and India commenced about 2,000 years ago, they had, uh, the Javanese loved this Hindu system. And so they, they using their Javanization strategies of syncretic, uh, uh, incorporation, they javanized the Hindu religion and they javanized the Hindu cosmological model uh, and uh, through a system of physicalization of the, the, the seven the concentric rings of continents and oceans uh, that is the cosmological model of the Hindu universe, they created the palace and so the palace complex is very much the architecturalization of this larger symbolic mandala system of the Hindu cosmological order. And so the palace itself is a microcosmic model of the larger universe and of the world. And it's not just a symbolic model. It turns out that it is an instrument for uh, returning the world to balance. Like when the world gets out of balance, when there's unrest, a volcano, earthquakes, famine, riots, political unrest, they uh, 
they use the palace to restore order in between heaven and earth. And the key to this order is the understanding that all good fortune that we enjoy here on earth flows from the heavens through an umbilical cord that enters the world at the center of the palace. And so the, the good fortune and the sacred forces enter at the center of this symbolic instrument and then moves out into the world in concentric circles of decreasing power and sacredness out through each of the courtyards of the palace, especially to the north and south, and out to the rest of the world. And this is the explanation for everything. So if the election, I suspect that prior to today's election, they performed a special ritual, or lots of rituals, to ensure uh, that there wasn't political violence in, throughout Indonesia. And they may have done it at the request of the current president, who is from Solo, uh, from this city. He is from this, uh, the city of Solo, also known as Surakarta. Um, and every year, uh, the, the, on the anniversary of the coronation of the king, they perform one of these rituals that renews the sacred importance of the king. Uh, and they perform this sacred uh, Bedoyo Katawang dance. And I think you were there once. You went. Yeah, once. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would go to that every year. And it's just a further demonstration of the importance of all of these rituals. Uh, and the focus of this, the coronation festival is this tower. Some people say it looks like uh, a Dutch windmill um, without the blades, uh, but it's a sacred tower that at the anniversary of the original coronation of this king in 1942, when he was, I think, 10 years old, uh, he was coronated king. Uh, the Japanese invaded a few months later, and he was king until his death in 2004. Uh, and every year on the anniversary of that coronation, he, there, all of these ceremonies would occur and then he would climb to the top chamber of this tower where he would renew through sexual union with the Queen of the South Seas, this connection that has been passed on from king to king to king throughout the Madaram dynasty. Uh, and, so despite all these things, when I, um, at the same time I was learning all of these lessons, I was also finding out that the local university, my good friends at the local university, had been uh, contracted by uh, the Minister of Culture and Tourism, uh, someone Hassan knows because he lived in Indonesia, uh, Yupave. Um, a very flamboyant character and very strong uh, purpose, he decided that it was time to take these broken down buildings and fix them, right? Good historic preservation practice. You don't let your cultural uh, heritage decay and fall apart like this. And so he hired the local university to come in and, uh, and do a historic preservation project. And they looked around the world for best practices. And the one they identified as the model that they wanted to follow was Colonial Williamsburg, which have you studied Colonial Williamsburg? You looked at it a little bit, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so the, I, the strategy was basically to take the royal family and move them out of the palace uh, so that the palace could be restored. And then instead of moving back the royal family uh, to take it back as, a, as their home, that, that's not what they did in Williamsburg. In Williamsburg, they hired actors to pretend to be uh, the residents of the historic fabric, uh, like at Plymouth Plantation or Sturbridge Village. And so according to that model, you don't allow the royal family back into the palace. You you hire professional, professionals who will play the part of the royal family. And you take 
um, you take this, this area at the front and you make a new shopping mall and hotel center. You take the Dutch fort and you make it into a hotel conference center. You take, you leave the mosque because you don't want to mess with that. But you go one by one and take each of these structures, you make a gift shop here. You take that sacred tower and you make it, uh, you open it up uh, to tourists so that you can have an overlook of the palace complex. You take the sacred residence of the king and his six wives, basically the harem of the palace, and you make it a five-star hotel. You make the, uh, the education center at the front of the palace, uh, you make that the gift shop, you, and you take, uh, etc. You make a, a cinema for showing a documentary film on the history of the palace, as people enter, and you curate uh, a, a museum-like route through the palace complex uh, to see demonstrations of this and that, just as you would in Colonial Williamsburg. Um, so, is that a good idea? Is that is that a good? You know, so I I think that um, it's interesting to note that the professional architects of the local university of Gajamada in Jakarta, this was their recommendation based on best practices of the United States, of the historic preservation. Uh, and I'm sure they refer to the Secretary of the Interior's guidelines uh, and all kinds of charters uh, that these are the best practices. But it it's, was very useful for us uh, in the palace to look at this plan and say, well, what is wrong with this plan? And uh, the, there were three princesses who said, I'm not, I'm not leaving the palace. And they went on a hunger strike to protest this plan. And this is where I started to move into this role of helping out to create an alternative plan. I remained close colleagues and friends with uh, the university people who made their plan. Um, but all the time, I was helping the royal family develop an alternative plan. <clears throat> and we did. Um, but the interesting uh, aspect of this is as we looked back at what happened in the aftermath of the fire in 1985. In the aftermath of the fire, uh, the central government in Jakarta sent an engineer uh, to rebuild the palace. And the assumption was, yeah, it was wood. Wood is old. Wood burns. Let's build it in concrete, because that's what we do. We don't have the old, uh, we don't have, you know, it's so expensive to get those big timbers. Um, we can't afford that. So let's build it in concrete, which is what a lot of uh, the traditional architecture has been reproduced in concrete. Um, but as he started to work with the royal family, he realized, wait a minute, this is still a, he went through the same process that I went through only uh, 10 years earlier. He went through this process of, of slowly coming to grips with the fact that the religious practices are still alive and well, and uh, heroically pushed back against the government sanction to rebuild the palace as quickly as possible using whatever means and according to modern conventions of construction of substituting concrete for all the wood. And he said, no, we're going to rebuild it in wood. So that's what they did. And uh, for the four sacred pillars at the center of the palace and the most sacred site, it was just like Issei Shrine. They go to the sacred forest to the north, south, east, and west of the palace. And they chose one tree from each forest they tied a, 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 a holy sash around the tree, and they put a priest there to meditate day and night for days and days and days until the proper signals are received that uh, basically the gods are saying, no, you can't have this tree. No, you can't have this tree. But after days and days of meditation at the base of the tree, eventually the gods uh, softened and said, OK, you may take this tree, as long as you do this, 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 all these rules are communicated through the priest who's in a trance. And so the princess here is now harvesting the tree by hand. 
It took her a long, long, no, she, they gave, she just made the first few chops and then in come the chainsaws. But they have to do this first in order to satisfy the requirements of the ongoing. And here's the king putting a gold nail into the base of one of the smaller pillars. And so this is also a requirement of the religious practices. So there's all these layers and layers and layers of ritual just to build uh, anything. Um, and so they rebuilt it after the fire. They perform all of the uh, tasks, all the rituals. And, but they don't move the sacred relics that are important to the, uh, the Javanese New Year procession. They have to allow the sacredness of the building to accrue. It has to accumulate year after year. And after 10 years or so, they start to move in some of the less sacred um, uh, relics back into the palace. And then after 20, 30, 40 years, it's sacred enough. It's accumulated enough power that they can move them all back in. So it's really interesting uh, to see how uh, important the buildings are uh, in the context of the religious system. And so this is all uh, very closely related to Regal, which is what I learned when I took this class when I arrived at MIT in 96. Uh, when I was there, I asked the question, well, what matters most? Is it the buildings or is it the religion? And the answer I was getting was, it's the religion. The buildings are an instrument to keep the religious practices going. The living cultural tradition is what's important. And at the core of our counter-proposal to compete with the colonial Williamsburg model was, uh, it, it's a, our critique of the Williamsburg model is, it would be horrible to crucify the living culture so that you can bring it back to life on the third day uh, in a colonial Williamsburg model. If the Rockefellers had had access to uh, a culture that was the unbroken continuation of the people who originally settled in Williamsburg, they would have done the, everything they could to keep that, those families in place. And um, if there was a blacksmith who refused to go to electric blowers on his, on his furnace when he was shoeing his horses, they would do whatever they could to keep him in business. If he was the son of the son of the son of the son of the original blacksmith, they would not say, time to get out. And so this was our argument. And, um, and so Yubave uh, relent relented and allowed the palace to continue in, on it, in its traditional way. And we actually proposed making the conservation of the palace a part of the attraction. That uh, the work that was going on was part of the museum tour. Uh, it had a horrible museum. Uh, they never really fixed it. But um, the conservation practice and the conservation work that you see us doing here was part of the, uh, part of the value and richness of presenting the palace to outsiders. Um, and one of the things that we were able to do is just about the time of this colonial Williamsburg proposal, the prince in charge of leading the tour uh, thought it was a good idea to, uh, to stop making the tourists put on this gold and red sash that you see in all these images. Let's see. Well, you see, both of us are wearing these gold and red sashes. And so before any tourists could come into the palace, they had to put on this gold and red sash. And um, they sat down with me and they said, we think uh, people, especially foreigners like you, think it's annoying to have to go through this, this thing of having to wear the sash. So we're going to drop it. And I said, actually, uh, when you ask us to wear the golden red sash, we start to ask questions. Well, why, what does this mean? Why do we have to wear it? What parts of the palace are, uh, are we okay not wearing it? And why, when we go through this threshold, do we suddenly have to wear the sash? And it's, 
it's part of the, the value of the experience to, to kind of experience that there are different levels of sacredness depending on how close you are to the belly button where all the sacred forces come from the heavens into the earth and spread out. If you're going through this gateway, it's, oh no, don't go in there unless you're wearing the sash, unless your shoulders are covered, unless if uh, you can't wear shorts, you can't wear sandals, uh, you, and you have to wear the sash. That's part of the value of this. Um, so before we get into the actual conservation work, maybe this is a good place to take a break? Yes, there's a project that you can do with lots of different interests here. Hopefully you get a good, hopefully you get a first mm. choice. Okay, let's go. So any questions? I just have one part left, which is the conservation work we did. Yeah. Oh, syncretization, yeah. syncretism, or Javanization. Yeah, Javanization, it is because of, like, I don't want to sound mean or anything, but like ignorance, or is it? I think it's the opposite. I think it's um, ex extremely sophisticated uh, maneuver uh, to find value in everything and make it your own. <clears throat> so, uh, the, the carriages, for example, they must have power, this powerful queen and this powerful nation that was so powerful it was able to colonize us. There's power there, and they respect power. Uh, all, po all physical power is grounded in spiritual power. There must be something to this, and we honor, and so it must ultimately come... Uh, derived from the same source that we venerate. So it's just a, uh, an unfamiliar manifestation of the powers that we uh, respect and venerate. And so we're obligated to uh, honor and take it in and it makes our culture richer for it. Uh, it's, it's a strategy also for defending against the Dutch coming in and saying, okay, stop doing what you're doing, do what we want you to do. Uh, it's, it's a jujitsu-like maneuver to deflect that, how, that force in, and, and make it work for you. Yeah. So what is the significance of the red sash, the like red gold sash you were talking about? Like why do you have to wear it? Uh, you have to wear it to signal to the Queen of the South Seas who's overlooking everything, to say, I'm not a spy, I'm not an enemy, I am a friend of the king. And if I'm a friend of the king, then you'll protect me too, right? Because you're protecting the king. And she says yes. And uh, if I walk into the palace without my sash on, I'm at risk of bad things happening to me, like suddenly, and I've had this happen in Bali where um, my arm went into spasm and it was explained to me, well, yeah, of course your arm went into spasm. You're coming in here and you're posing a threat, you're doing this architecture thing and someone doesn't like that. So yeah, you gotta be careful, right? So there's an explanation for these things and I don't want, you know, we don't want anything bad to happen so we put on the sash. Also, in certain cases, certain colors in Indonesia are not oh, right. uh, frowned upon, depending on where you're going. If you go to the beach uh, on the Indian Ocean and you wear that sweatshirt, we know that green. Yeah, we know what happens. Yeah. Sayonara. <laughs> you, uh, you're going to be swept out to sea by the undertow. Really? Yeah. So don't wear green. green don't wear green. green. Have you seen that yourself? Have you seen that yourself? Well, no one's ever worn green at the, at the oh, Indian Ocean, because they know. So no one does it. So, so it worked. And no one gets swept out. Well, still some people get swept out to sea. 
who knows? But isn't the green the color of Islam? Green is the color of Islam. Uh, but when you go to the beach, don't wear green. You know, both things are true. See, this is the weird thing. I would, I would, I would, uh, when I was doing my research, I would, um, just as the prince would be perfectly happy to allow me to misread things or to read it one way and not the other way, I would go and I'd say, okay, this column has eight sides. Uh, what's the symbolism? What's the symbolism of, of these different parts? And the eight-sided thing, well, eight is a sacred number in Islam, and the prophet lived to be the age of 64, which was eight, eight groups of eight-year periods. The eight-year um, eight period is a sacred time period. Uh, and so eight of those, that's the prophet's life, and so the symbol eight is embedded in the column. And I'd say, oh, great. And I'd write that down, and I'm all set to, to report on, I know the meaning of the shape, the form of this column. But then I'd just check, just to make sure, just to confirm, I'd ask someone else. And they'd say, oh, yeah, so it's the eight compass points, and uh, in Hinduism, life uh, emanates from the east, and you move through the phases of life as, you, as the sun crosses, uh, and, these, and then it sets in the west, and and it's a, he would give me the, the Hindu interpretation. Uh, and then I'd get another one that had to do with um, the Queen of the South Seas, perhaps. So you have all these different religious traditions merging together in the symbolism of the architecture in a single form of a single column. And I'd go to the prince and I'd say, help me out here. Uh, I'm getting these different conflicting stories. Who is right? And his answer would be, why are you insisting that one of them is right and the others are wrong? Why can't you just accept that these are different uh, interpretations of, uh, a, uh, you know, the world is a complex place. There are many routes to the top of the mountain. And when you're climbing up one route to the top of the mountain, you don't necessarily see the, all the other routes uh, until you get to the top. And then you see that all those routes are leading to the same place. It seems pretty sophisticated to me. It would be great if uh, the world were more like that. <laughs> uh, and during the break, I got a text from my friend, actually my ex-girlfriend, who showed me the photo of the gate, uh, the pianist, the, the ex-pianist. She texted me and she said, Joko, we won 55% to 45%, but Prabowo, the war criminal, the son-in-law of the dictator, the, um, the butcher who massacred uh, tens of thousands of people in East Timor, he's claiming victory. Yeah. Time for some more rituals in the palace to try to restore the balance between heaven and earth. We'll see if it worked. So other questions? So um, the idea that emerges from this is that given the ongoing operation of these forces in people's lives, these are not just going to church on Sunday, sure, you know, kind of casual, uh, unconsequential uh, beliefs. These are fundamental, they change everything. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm curious why the initial proposal for the reconstruction was based on building the Williamsburg model. We have other models like the East Coast Shrine, like living tradition, available mm -hmm. within you know, relative proximity. Like, well, why would you pick a model that's incredibly foreign, you know, culturally, as opposed to something that's going closer? See, this is, this is the core question of our age. I think it has to do with uh, the position of the United States in the world, that uh, when people, uh, when Indonesian, you know, really smart Indonesians graduate from their undergraduate program, uh, their professors and parents say, you need to go to college overseas. You need to get a master's degree somewhere else. Go to the United States. The United States is where they do things right. Uh, 
The thing is that when people arrive in the United States, they enter the graduate programs and we teach them how to be critical thinkers. So you take this for granted. But uh, people uh, in other places, they're learning the rules, they're learning how to do things right, they're learning the system, and they're not questioning it. Uh, co they're not constantly questioning the things they're being taught. But you here are trained. We reward you when you question the reasons behind underlying everything. And if you don't question everything, um, you're just not going to be, you know, you're not going to get an A. So it's interesting that we established these conventions and the people around the world look at these conventions and they assume, well, that must be the best thing. It's a best practice kind of way of approaching the world. So watch out when people talk about best practices. Best practices are essential reference points, but if you just follow them uncritically, they can do unpredictable levels of damage and harm. And so uh, the critical evaluation of what worked in Colonial Williamsburg was just not a part of their approach. They just said, if the Americans do it this way, that must be a best practice. We should do it that way. And it wasn't questioned until uh, we helped question, question that best practice. I guess in the old, in the old days, um, they would also look towards Holland. Yes. Because Holland was a colonial power that rule, control, brought modernism to that part of the world, brought new architecture. So, it, but in the 20th century and later on, America becomes the sort of model for all kinds of things. This is where science happens. This is where computers are done. This is where best practices occur. So it's not surprising. So if you were in uh, Indonesia, you'd probably look towards Holland. If I was in, in uh, India, I'd look towards the Brits. But eventually, you get to the point where America becomes a sort of intellectual and progressive powerhouse, right? So yeah. if they do things, um, they must be doing it right in some way. Especially in the post-colonial period yeah, where yeah. the Dutch, you know, they dominated us for 350 years. Uh, the Dutch would arrive uh, like I arrived, and I would say, um, can I help you do conservation practice? They would say, thanks, but no thanks. But an American, it's slightly more uh, attractive than a Dutch person because we're still a little pissed off about the colonial thing, <laughs> right? So an American, it's easier for me to show up. And <laughs> so, uh, the, so they were surprised that I had any interest at all in this old stuff. They expected me in the 90s, they expected me to be there and say, yeah, skyscrapers, glass, steel, concrete, that's what we do in the United States. Um, and so they, it was a very, it took a while for them to believe me when I said, no, I'm interested in the cultural richness of all this. Uh, and they would look at me and shake their heads saying, but isn't this so old? Why, why are you interested in this old stuff? They were forward looking. And so the, the essence of this is that it's possible to arrive uh, and look at the world of Java and say, yeah, everything old will be replaced by everything new, just as it did in, in the West, right? We, Colonial Williamsburg went away and we revive it after the fact as a museum. It, we, we understand that these people are all actors, they aren't real. This isn't a real living culture, it's being play acted for our appreciation, right? And that's inevitable. There's a globalization, uh, a myth of globalization that, that's inevitable um, and just face the facts. And on, a, uh, on some days I would ask my friend Gusti Depo, the prince, I'd sit there in the front and I'd say, so is it an inevitable that this palace uh, goes away? And he said, maybe, you know, that this will become a parking lot, this will become a shopping mall. He was willing to entertain the possibility 
that it would become a Colonial Williamsburg's theme park uh, a replica of its former existence, and they would all move out. And that could still happen. But I came and they started to see it through my eyes that, um, oh my God, you, what you have here is so much more valuable. Forget about the buildings. The buildings are just, uh, or the restoration of the buildings, the highest value that the buildings have is as a vehicle to access this rich living tradition that still exists. So buildings can decay and fall into the dust, that's all right, but the living tradition is what gives us hope that it will be rebuilt according to all the instructions of the gods with the gold nail, the meditation, all those practices, that's, that's the last hope. That's the thing that keeps it truly alive. That's where the value is. And so by asking what is important, what's the criteria for deciding, I didn't know it until I showed up at MIT and met Hassan in 1996. I didn't realize it then, but basically I was discovering what Regal wrote about 100 years earlier that you read, that the value of a piece of heritage is not necessarily the value of other. You have to evaluate each piece of heritage for in its own right. What, where is, what is the source of value? Is it, like Borobudur, is it the stones are the same stones as were there in the ninth century? These are the stones, and you can touch them, and that's the value. The relics in Notre Dame, uh, Notre Dame in Paris. That is a splinter of wood from the true cross that Jesus was crucified on, or at least that's what we think. And so let the building burn, grab that relic out of the reliquary uh, of Notre Dame. This is basically all of the priceless artwork and relics from the building before they like, really tried to tackle the fire. Right. So this is not foreign to us. Regal makes sense whether you've read Regal or not. I was practicing Regal without knowing who the guy was. Never heard of him. When they were rushing into the reliquary, they were just acting on common sense. Decide what's valuable, get it. Grab the baby, don't grab your laptop computer. Grab your children before you grab, go back in. And you're, you know what? Don't go back in. No, it's... You, you'll, you'll be fine. <laughs> save your dog. Which do you save first, the laptop or the dog? That's the word. Okay, you better reread Regal. <laughs> or, or talk to a friend about reevaluating your priorities in life. <laughs> That's true. That's, I guess there's a certain... As of right now, this, this one terabyte hard drive is my life. Here's a question, do you have it on? Yes. Oh, you, never mind, never mind. I suggest you back it up. Well, not, not very fan, but so. So given this, and I think this is the most thorough discussion we've ever had <laughs> in this class, because uh, I've done this maybe eight, eight or nine times. Um, this is the most thorough discussion. I'm really enjoying it. It's part because my slides were totally disorganized this morning by the system change that I, that I uh, was uh, afflicted with. But uh, given those values, what then must we do with the buildings? And uh, we said, when we had the chance, uh, the Aga Khan Award for Architecture uh, became interested. Um, they said, we would like to have our award ceremony every three years, as you probably learned. No, we haven't. I don't think so every three years, done. there's an award. Except we're going to do it in my Asia, maybe it's a couple of years. And uh, you might know some, someone who was uh, there to set up the award when it first started. Is your professor here? He set it up um, back in the day, 80, 
77. 77. Uh, when His Highness uh, the Aga Khan wanted to establish the award, he called up Hassan uh, and he and his colleagues set it up and it's still going strong. And in 1995, they held their award ceremony in this palace. And um, uh, leading up to that, they said, uh, we would like to support uh, some work to, to help the palace, uh, first of all, to become more worthy of a venue for the ceremony so that the buildings are not falling apart. You know, it shows it in its, you know, favorable light. But also, and, I, and in talking with the, um, the award team, I said, well, it's very important that uh, not just the, the buildings and location uh, for the award ceremony itself, but there's a king, there's uh, a royal family, there are a set of religious practices. This palace needs some help to restore the most important aspects of the architecture in order to support the ongoing cycles of rituals. And they graciously agreed to uh, do what, you know, to, to, before they fixed the site of the award ceremony itself, they would support the restoration of whatever was necessary. And so we went in, uh, we went to the king and said, you know, what would you like us to focus on? And how would you like us to do it? Because um, you're the source of value. You are the continuous link to the dynastic lineage that links all the way back to the Queen of the South Seas. You are the source of value. And it all emanates from you, the family, and these practices, these religious practices. So he said, um, It's 11 o'clock. I'm so sorry again. <laughs> Someone was supposed to teach me how to fix that. Um, so we started looking at these buildings. We did a lot of drawings. Uh, we mapped out the palace uh, for the first time. Before there was Google Earth, uh, we got our hands on an aerial photograph, and uh, I had a team. Um, and we redrew all the buildings. This is uh, my friend Pa'asmo. He is a priest. Um, uh, he is the descendant of several priests who uh, have inherited the sacred um, obligation to maintain the buildings. He is also a builder. And uh, he, uh, we started this is the place where the Aga Khan award ceremony uh, was held. But before we fixed these buildings, we needed to repair the tower devoted to the Queen of the South Seas. Um, okay, so we, um, wearing the sashes, that's him um, before we started the work. We're all wearing the sashes. It's not a very bright projector. And um, the same sashes that... down a couple of the middle ones. So the same sashes that everybody wears, our team was wearing in order to go into the palace to um, start doing the work. Um, and this is the tower we worked on. Some of the pillars had started to rot, and there was actually some partial sagging of some of these balconies. And so we performed the required offerings, uh, and the priest is also the carpenter. And using hand tools, not power tools, he would fashion each of these uh, columns that would then replace the rotting columns. And the, the, the columns were being harvested from trees from the sacred forest. So all the ritual practices were being observed. Uh, here's one of the columns in place. Um, uh, and then once we had done the tower to take care of the most, the highest priority sacred sites uh, of the palace, we could then move on to the other elements. This is how badly rotted a lot of it was. Um, they went to work, noticed they're wearing their sashes. This one, uh, I guess he does have it. 
You can wear it around your neck or you can tuck it into your waistband. It's also an option. Um, and there's the finished product. Um, the ceiling is also a problem. Now here's, here's where some of the conservation practice um, issues uh, became especially difficult for me. Before I went to architecture school, I did a lot of construction, especially the restoration of wood structures um, in New England. And so I was um, a professional restorer, you know, stripping paint, examining the paint layers, figuring out the colors, uh, and doing appropriate repair work based on wood, tech, wood science, how the wood fibers uh, behave uh, in changing seasons. This was a case where I was challenged in everything I knew. Um, we mobilized uh, a team of craftspeople, the ones who had tradition inherited the, the tasks, the responsibilities for caring for the palace. And um, we ran into problems where uh, the experts said, yes, we use Bondo. Who knows what Bondo is? So what is Bondo for? Yeah, it's for auto body repair. So if you get a, a ding and you don't want to remove the quarter panel and pound it out from the inside, you basically you fill it with this highly adhesive hard plastic that doesn't budge, right? It, it stays in place, it works. Well, what happens if you put something that doesn't move and you use it in a wood structure? Have you guys studied this stuff? Yeah, what happens? When the wood structure extends and contracts, uh, the plastic doesn't extend and contract with it, so it'll do more damage and like, start building Exactly. And so as a good conservationist, I went and I said, no, we're not going to use Bondo. <laughs> Sorry, um, we're not going to use Bondo. Bondo would ruin the whole thing. It would destroy the wood when it moves. And he said, no, we do it all the time. It's fine. Don't worry. He was very patient with me. I said, don't worry. It'll be fine. And eventually I just, you know, because I didn't want to be the white guy from America, you know, white splaining, America splaining my, you know, how he's being an ignorant fool. And so I didn't do that. He used Bondo. And years and years later, it was perfect. It turns out that if the humidity remains uh, at 90, 95% all the time, it turns out you're fine. And it was fine. So I, he, I learned, I, fortunately I didn't fight that battle, I didn't push at all. I deferred, I learned enough about Javanese culture that I was able to just bow and say, of course, you are right, and uh, so I didn't make a fool of myself. They did it, and it worked great. Um, there are stories of furniture importers. They bring these gorgeous tables from Java. You, you've probably experienced this in some way or another. Um, the, the one I like is this thick slab of teak made into a table, imported into New York City, and uh, uh, a few weeks after arrival, in the middle of the night, there's this sound like a gunshot, this explosion. And he runs down to his living room to see, or his dining room to see what, what happened. And there's this huge crack in the middle of the table. It was this teak that was you know, perfectly fine for years and years and years in Java. Uh, that it, it, the, the winter humidity, you know, the forces built up and built up until it exploded. Um, and the table had this huge crack in the middle of it because of the shrinkage and the change in humidity. So not a problem as long as you don't move this building to New York. So it goes from this to this. Uh, beautiful glass chandeliers reproduced. Um, new paint job, all the workers. 
uh, meticulously painted, uh, and the conservation practice became a vehicle for restoring the arts uh, that were associated with the palace. Fortunately, a lot of it had been fashionable in the 80s and 90s to redo hotel lobbies. Uh, this is another argument in favor of the interior design avenue towards heritage conservation. But hotel lobbies had been done in these concrete modern structures, but then they fit out the lobbies in a traditional mode. And so the art of painting in the traditional manner and carving in the traditional manner had been kept alive. Um, and so the results uh, were very, very pleasing and, and very wonderful. Um, and when uh, another challenge was we, when we were doing the work, we would look at the paint colors and we'd say, this building was first constructed in 1867 by the 10th uh, king and uh, these are the colors that were used uh, and we take that to the king and we would say we suggest we match these original colors um, however it's up to you uh, you are the source of the value of the palace we will do what you want us to do which is what, you're, you're not supposed to do that, you're supposed to look at what the original colors were and you're supposed to replicate that. That's what we know from our educations. But in everything we did, uh, we had to overcome those lessons because the source of value lay elsewhere. It's not in the original color, it's in the renewal of what the current source of value is. So instead of uh, the etched glass bearing the emblem of the 10th king, we replaced it with etched glass that bore the emblem of the 12th king because uh, what would it mean to restore the palace, that, that glass, and refer back to the 10th king even though it was being done by the 12th king? It would actually lose its value, not gain value, because it would be it would not be a renewal of these, uh, uh, it would not be reinforcing the connection to the sacredness, it would be reinforcing the connection to some historic. So the historic connection uh, of the original glass is not where the value lay in this case. Uh, and if you think back to Regal, this is a very direct translation of Regal's methods to the the decisions on the ground in the detailed decisions of the restoration process. Uh, and it's tough because it runs a counter to all kinds of professional uh, knowledge. But uh, in the end, uh, the, the method of identifying value and following the value chain back to the source of value does uh, suggest that you make the glass uh, authentic to the current ruler, not the former ruler. Um, this was not replaced, so this is related back to uh, the tenth. And here we have His Highness the Aga Khan, an old friend of Hassan's, the king of Java, uh, the Minister of uh, Education and Culture at the time. Uh, and there I am, tagging along as the translator uh, from Indonesian and Javanese to English. Uh, and Farouk, the current secretary. Is that Farouk? I think it is Smiley. Sarah would be. Oh, uh, okay. no? I think, anyway, yeah. Uh, he was there. Sure. And I, um, so the ongoing challenge is in 2004, the 10th, uh, the 12th king died, and there was uh, a scramble in the royal family, scandalous, uh, competing for who's going to succeed the king. And the oldest son, who had had a stroke and some, some evidence of him not being quite fully mentally 
uh, on top of things. And then later revelations that he's guilty, it looks like he's guilty of uh, uh, underage, basically rape, uh, drugging young women. And, uh, so an unsavory character, he, he uh, blockaded the doorway to the palace and uh, managed to physically defend his position uh, against uh, this uh, member of the royal family uh, who was competing with him. So the challenge is, I'd, if, if I were to go back now, it would be very difficult for me to take the same attitude towards the current uh, mm. king because of what I, I know too much about his background. Um, and I'm not sure what I would do. Um, but in the meantime, the practices continue on. And this is a photo from the New York Times um, of a more recent uh, coronation. I think that's coronation uh, ceremony going on in the palace. Uh, and so these things go on. And I guess that's where we stop. <laughs> A new version of the what? I didn't know we could get a new version of an island. Instead of a new version of Java. Uh, oh, Java right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Welcome to my nightmare. The first, uh, when the internet, I don't know if you guys know this, but the internet didn't always exist. Um, in 1994, uh, when my wife, uh, current wife, she wasn't my wife at the time, she said, check this out. It's called the internet. And I said, the internet, and she explained it to me, and uh, she said, do a search, and I said, well, I'm, in, I'm doing research on Java. So I typed in Java, and I got like 40,000 hits. I was like, whoa, fantastic. But of course, it was... <laughs> Not the Java. It wasn't the Java I, <laughs> I was hoping for. <laughs> yeah. So that's 11.15, I think. We're good? Yeah. Okay. More questions? Comments? Observations? Suggestions? So I guess one of the things that I hope comes through, it does come through, is that um, value systems vary around the world. Who makes the decisions? Where expertise lies as opposed to the common person, if you like, the non-expert, the non-specialist. And these are all questions of uh, HP that we actually asked today. What is the role of the public? Who do you listen to? What rights have you as a, spe as a specialist, somebody who knows old buildings and knows how they work? Where is that limit when you do actually do some work? And I think it raises for us, you know, what is HP really about? Is it the buildings? Is it the continuation of the tradition? Is it about giving value to some characters? Is it, what, what is it about? What is it that we want to get? And the other question I always ask is who benefits? Okay, we get tax credit. Who's going to benefit from those? Probably some developer. Uh, do the people benefit? And so who's our client in a sense? Is it these guys, the builders, or is it the people who use these buildings? So I think there's a range of, uh, of things that uh, this Anisa Shrine and, and a bunch of other examples really raises for us practicing in the West, especially. And the Nara Charter. Yeah, we're going to come to the Charter soon. A Which was ago. like 94? Uh, yeah. It was around the time of my work in the palace that um, they signed. Oh, 94, exactly. You're right. They signed a new charter uh, that acknowledged that um, maybe these, these guidelines for conservation that were developed in the context of the, the rupture of modernism in the West were not appropriate for places like Japan, where the Issei Shrine was not a relic of the past and the physical thing was the important thing, but where there was a living culture that also had significance. And the challenge was to acknowledge the value of the living culture, not just the physical uh, artifacts. Mm -hmm.
In fact, as you probably know, at this moment in time, there's a huge discussion and debate about historic districts and what we should do with them. That quite often we freeze these in place and don't allow the change. Uh, recently in San Juan in Puerto Rico, there's a huge discussion about what can we do with San, San Juan's on the historic list. And it means that there's certain things you can't do, but life goes on and it's moved forward and new technologies come in. So they're trying to see if they can actually change the application of historic districts and cardinal charters. Uh, so it's an interesting moment in time where HP is going to have to take stock of becoming, of being re remaining re relevant for older places or people as well. Um, I mean, I don't really know much about the development of San Juan, but do you think that's also partly in line with the hurricanes that happen in the island causing a lot of damage and like being able to move forward? So it's kind of Maybe. kind of a similar idea as to what's happening now with uh, Nam, where something happened. What are we going to do about it now? So like, you know, prior to the hurricanes, maybe it wasn't such a big deal, but... Yeah, although the San Juan thing has been going on for a number of years before right. the hurricanes, but it's interesting, but there we're dealing with a district full of different kinds of buildings, right? spaces, buildings, ages for that matter, from the, and the forts to, to normal housing. The Notre Dame is such a special place in the sense that it's one of the world's great treasures. Right. So to me, it's, it's um, clearer that you've got to either restore it back to something, but again, the same question comes back to what, and for whom, and what purposes. Is it, uh, what are you going to date it to? Because that was built over time as well, and things happen. So it's an interesting question, Notre mm -hmm. Dame. And we'll see what happens. And Viola Le Duc and uh, Ruskin, the debates between their two approaches. We still continue. That's why we you know, spend a certain amount of time with Ruskin and Le Duc. Can you just put the light on, please, somebody? Yeah. 